So welcome, good morning. Um, my name is Manuel Roman Lacayo. I am the acting director for the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, we are really happy to have you among us. Uh, today we have a very special guest, Lisa de Gioia Nutini, who will be leading us through Dia de los Muertos uh, traditions and celebration, uh, especially with a focus on, on the Mexican um, celebration. We want to welcome our friends from, um, from different schools who are joining us. Uh, Lisa will be, um, as I said, uh, she is the owner of Mexico Lindo, and she is a um, tried and true year after year uh, celebrant of Dia de los Muertos. Uh, she is also an awesome DJ. Uh, last night, uh, we also helped and supported an event that she leads at La Palapa. Um, she's just all around wonderful, and we hope that we can have her more often. But for now, I just want to uh, leave you with Lisa as she talks about Dia de los Muertos. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm in front of my ofrenda that I built for all of us this year. And um, it's not the size that I'm usually accustomed to doing, but I may do this is I'm in my basement. <laughs> so um, I just want to point out a few features of this to you uh, before we get into our program. In the center, uh, you can see a necklace and it's a beaded Huicho necklace from Mexico representing Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And on the right, I have a skeleton holding a sign that says good trouble in honor of uh, Representative John Lewis, who we lost. These are two people who we, and I feel that I owe a lot to. Um, my, my friends are always personal uh, for the most part, but this one different than any other year because of the pandemic. And so, there's no way to say all of the names this year. And I decided uh, this was going to have to do. I also have a lot of family that ordinarily I would represent with photographs and I didn't have enough room for that. But um, hopefully, I think we have the capacity later for anyone that wants to share and a friend that they've made and hopefully we'll see some of your family photographs. Um, I have all of the required elements, so to speak, but I don't have Panda Muerto again because of the pandemic. So uh, apologies for that. And that's a special bread that we make on Day of the Dead that should always be on a friend of when possible, um, a sweet bread that's decorated with bones. Um, so there's a lot of artwork here from some of the best folk artists in Mexico. Um, there are a lot of uh, small and large details. Um, the artwork itself we'll get into toward the end of our presentation. What is Dia de los Muertos and what's up with all those skeletons? As some of you may already know, a very, uh, an amalgamation of many cultures. And you can read the text that I have here, but I'm just going, I have it here as a reminder to me of where I am in my speaking to you. So the, this time of the year, the time of the, Fall equinox, the time of the harvest, has been celebrated in cultures throughout the world, but most notably the ones with beliefs in its relation to their dead um, were the Celtics and the ancient Mesoamericans. Um, so in, in both cases, they had very um, established traditions and the uh, 
festivities around that would begin on All Hallows Eve, Halloween or Samhain uh, in their tradition. And the understanding has always been that this is the time when the windows between the worlds are very fluid and open and that it's easier for us to communicate. Um, the archeological evidence um, supports this in the case of pre-Columbian art, um, artifacts found on sites of temples throughout Mexico and throughout Latin America. And you see the artwork that has skeletons within it and Lots of times you have half life, half death. In the case of the mask with the three that you're looking at, that's known as the mask of death and rebirth. So this is just a very core foundation of these societies. Um, and the what happens next is the conquest. So they found the conquistadors who were very usually accompanied by some priests, whether they held the beliefs or not. They were very strict about what they saw as pagan activities. And they didn't understand the people's expressions and beliefs. And they were frightened by it. So they imagined all sorts of things that may or may not have been true or maybe partially true. Uh, and without that understanding, they worried about everybody being a little bit carried away. So they coerced people to move, condense holidays into what they created to be All Souls Day and All Saints Day. And um, then the, the tradition started to take on blends of Catholicism. And people, much like in Yoruba traditions, they might go along with the priests or the conquistadors and say, yes, yeah, sure, whatever you want. But they weren't changing their hearts or their minds. And they still found ways to keep the essences of their traditions. And so this is very much a belief that the dead live on, that we can communicate with them. Some people think it's just at this time of the year. Some people think it's all of the time, um, but it is a very uh, central tenant to everything that is related to Dia de los Muertos. If, for example, an atheist um, who also doesn't believe in any sort of afterlife wonders, well, what's in Dia de los Muertos for me? Um, they soon find uh, that, yes, they have dead, beloved dead people that they want to honor and remember and Perhaps it's very recently and they're in the throes of grief and they find building an ofrenda um, and sharing memories and feelings and expressing grief um, and joy at good remembering remembrances. They find that this is the type of resolution to feelings like that. So I, I've never seen it as a holiday limited to one singular group of people. And my experience in all the years of building a friend is in my store uh, showed me this by people's reactions to what I did. So this again is just another uh, elaboration on what I just said, but I want you to notice the beautiful tree of life at the top of that um, with a bright purple Katrina in the middle. Now, another uh, wonderful uh, related to Dia de los Muertos is its connection with uh, 
begin and end their annual migrations each year. And even though it takes four generations to complete one migration between North America and Michoacan, somehow that last generation that makes it back to the forest uh, to winter, they arrive on the day of the dead. And it's a very magical thing uh, to see them all arriving. One of these days I'll see it in person, maybe some of you have seen it. So there was an immediate association with the monarchs being representatives of the souls returning to be with us for Dia de los Muertos. Why throughout most of my friend, as you see, monarch butterfly themes and in the artwork. This is just a beautiful, beautiful example of how they look when they're sleeping or getting ready to go to sleep. And they tend to lose their color in the middle of that uh, heart of the wind. So um, we also discussed what that text there says, but I want you to note the beautiful outdoor ofrendas in Michoacan and Pascua on an island called Hanitio. There's a community very famous for their extremely elaborate outdoor all night vigils in the cemetery on November 1st. And they stay there all night. They light thousands of candles. They've usually gone a day or two before to clean and decorate the grave quite elaborately. And go to Hanizio and experience this if you can, but I've heard they really would rather we didn't. So you can find lots of online resources. Um, photographs and documentaries about this. And so they talk about why we put what we put on the ofrenda. You'll see bottles, you'll see food. My food's down at the bottom. I don't know if you can see it right now or not, but I have bananas, chocolate, avocados, grapes, apples. Um, for my late husband, I put his favorite things, Skittles and pom-poms and cigarettes, of course. Um, as we mentioned before, photographs. But sometimes you want something that's just a private joke between you and someone. And it can be anything. Um, ordinarily, you have three levels to an ofrenda and they represent the sky, the earth, and the underworld. Um, again, not a requisite, but in case you wondered, that's why you usually see that sort of wedding cake design. Here's some examples of a friend as I've made in the past. Um, a friend of building. <laughs> A lot of people will build an ofrenda just for one person. And this one was what I did on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Frida Kahlo's death. And it was in the window. And um, you'll often see that in Mexico. This was one of the first uh, ofrendas that I saw in Oaxaca on the Day of the Dead, not really an ofrenda, just an entrance to what I imagine was an amazing ofrenda within those doors. And that's when I decided someday I wanna do something wonderful with masses of marigolds. Well, I never got as many as you see there. Um, I still have hope. And, um, but yeah, that's, that's where I became completely taken with the whole concept a long time ago. So 
other things that you might want to note as far as items on the ofrenda are the colors that are used. So you see there we have black representing the land of the dead, purple from the Catholics to signify pain, grief, pink and orange to indicate the joy at the return of everyone we miss, white for hope, and yellow and orange for the marigolds, the sun and the light. We leave salt and water. Um, I've got my salt here and my water on the other end. And salt along with copal. Uh, uh, I have some copal. These are thought to purify. Uh, here's some copal resin. Um, and they do. If you ever get a chance to smell true copal, you want to experience that. Um, so they say that, that that's a sort of a protection and um, keeps away anyone we might not want to visit us. And the papel picado and any live flowers that are used represent the the brief time that we are here and how really nothing lasts. And always we want to keep that uppermost in our mind so that we live every day to the fullest, whenever and however possible. Uh, another name for the marigolds is Sempasuccio, and they say it means flower of 400 lives. Another amazing tradition, which I have yet to have the right space to do, um, is to use these petals that you see here, the marigold petals, and they make beautiful long trails to lead the dead to the ofrenda. So someday, I know you're all gonna help me make that a reality. Another important thing that I and a lot of people I've interacted with over the years do is to remember our pets. And here you see my dog who I lost back in 2007. And so I made a special box for him. Not, again, not that you have to do that. A photograph is sufficient. But I added St. Francis to it. So it's asking him to watch over him and um, put his treats and his collar there. Again, something that a lot of people find um, consolation in. Sugar skulls, you see I have a few here. I had um, real ones, meaning the ones made in Mexico are uh, from a, a hard uh, confectioner's sugar. You could break your teeth if you try to eat them, um, which doesn't stop children. <laughs> but these that I have here are made from a mold and they're made with granulated sugar. I have one that says love, one that says peace, another one that says honor, and the last one says justice. And I commissioned these years ago and I use them every year. And I never seem to stop worrying about the death of any of those, those mottos there um, more than ever. They seem appropriate this year. But of course, the fun thing to do is to buy them in Mexico, ones that, like you see here, and have them write the name of your loved one across the forehead. So yes, I'm sure We've all noticed the ubiquitousness of sugar skulls in other art forms. And I have a few examples there for you. The other ubiquitous image is that of La Catrina uh, by originally Jose Guadalupe Posada. And you see her everywhere. Um, and she was made in a, a time of political upheaval, a time of foreign European occupation. And Posada was a great engraver 
a great illustrator, um, worked for newspapers and made sly commentary, political commentary by disguising people as skeletons so that he couldn't get blamed for ridiculing someone famous or important. And uh, La Katrina was born. She was symbolizing uh, the uppity European woman who saw herself as better than the people, the very people whose land she was inhabiting. So although she didn't initially have such a good reputation, uh, we've given her her own, one much more cheerful and, and popular. So next I'm gonna show you some more slides of all the different forms of artwork. Um, you know, every, every conceivable item has been produced. And even having said that, I'm still amazed every time I go back to Mexico, how the artwork never stops evolving. And um, it's a beautiful thing. Um, these are uh, ceramics from Xalitla in the state of Guerrero. This is a, an extremely wonderful masterpiece by the director of the Popular Art Museum, uh, Folk Art Museum in Oaxaca, Maestro Carlo Manuel Pedro. Very spare and elegant. Whole different feeling. Uh, I can never resist their, their simple beauty. From the area called Izúcar de Matamoros in Puebla, there's a type of ceramic called barro polychromado, and you're going to see a few examples of that here. It's a very detailed uh, painting style, very humorous. These are ceramics from Metepec, which is also known for its trees of life. And one from the Aguilar family in Oaxaca in the center. So you have musicians, you have everybody being portrayed, doing what they love to do when they were here, seemingly continuing to do that in the afterlife, which sounds good to me. <laughs> and they don't want us to worry about them. They want us to you know, rejoice in their freedom. And sometimes that's difficult to do, but it's nice to have artwork like this and costumes like this to remind us. In the center, you have uh, a mask from the state of Guerrero. A lot of the masks that I carry are from this region. Um, and here's a good example of what I spoke of earlier of half life, half death. This is a mask from Tokoro in Michoacan very well-known family there, the Orta family. Um, whole nother level of mask making, uh, prized by many collectors. Another tree of life uh, with monarchs. This is from Metepec. More of the same. <laughs> One year, my sister-in-law, Martha, made me astounding cookies and I just had to show them to you because as you can see she's very talented and uh, it's not really a it's a very time-consuming endeavor not really uh, something you do except as a labor of love on the upper right you see a nicho and that's a whole nother, I think there are a few on the ofrenda over at La Palapa right now. I didn't put any here, but little boxes full of skeletons, enjoying their afterlife, doing everything from the silly to the wonderful to the profane. And um, here you have two brides, which was an unusual find back then. Here I'll brag about a family member, my brother-in-law. Alexis Nutini, master printmaker. This was one that he made in honor of his grandmother. 
and lived in Fortin, Fortin de los Flores in Mexico. Even the beaded artwork of the rituals is well suited to these themes. Um, also in La Palapa are some examples of that right now. If you go to see them, eat some good food, look at the ofrenda. This was by Grand Maestro Demetrio Garcia Aguilar from Oaxaca. And uh, some of his pieces like this one would be quite large, um, about a foot high, foot and a half high. And uh, he enjoyed exploring the issues of duality that you see here. Here's our friendly fellow reminding us what to do tomorrow to vote. And um, a priest who's, hmm, he's not happy about something. <laughs> this was an unusual piece from Shalit La. I had never seen one in black and gold and white. And a very prized piece from the famous family in Linares family in Mexico City, Afrida Kahlo, holding her esquintly dog. Another piece from Demetrio that made everybody laugh a very elaborate uh, skull with butterflies, um, famous design from Isuka. This is just a little something I felt I had to say <laughs> about the uh, preponderance of artwork related to this holiday that is made in Mexico that you can buy at the CVS or Giant Eagle or wherever. On one hand, I'm glad if people learn about the holiday, if they do, and I'm glad if they can't afford, you know, a really fancy, more expensive thing that they have something affordable. Uh, but on the other hand, this hurts Mexican artists very much and um, more so when it's done disrespectfully. So yes, I'm saying, please support Mexican artists in whatever way you can, even if it's only in sharing their work in whatever way feels good to you. This was the tally, which I'm sure has changed since 1 million 195,951 souls we've lost so far this year. Um, a year like no other. And um, above all, uh, who I'm sure we're all thinking of today. I also talk about every year, I used to for year after year, I used to keep tallies of the number of people died due to gun violence or war or any number of you know the things that trouble us. And I'm saying how, as I did earlier, how do we say their names? How do we honor them? And most of all, how do we communicate with them now? Do we think that they hear us? Um, I know my beliefs, but I'm always interested in knowing what other people think too. Uh, last but not least, <laughs> the only really required element is love. So, you know, I feel like you never build an ofrenda alone that um, as you're thinking about someone, and thinking what special thing am I going to get for them to show them my love. I feel that they hear you and they feel your love. And even if you have one candle and one photograph, if you have love, you have enough. Portions of this text came from articles that I had permission to excerpt. Um, and it helps me just to keep a sort of a placeholder and uh, so I wanted to acknowledge Judy King, Oscar Lopez, and Dale Hoyt Palfrey. And of course, I'm thanking my parents 
and my in-laws and my late husband um, because they were the ones who gave me Mexico and uh, I always thank them. And I think that's all. I think um, you have links, right? That you wanna show? Yeah, in fact, um, and, and, and they're in the next slide. Um, and, and I wanted to thank you, ah, there Lisa. They are. Yeah. Okay. I, and, and, and I wanted to thank you, Lisa, because it, it, it's wonderful um, and, and to be able to go into the detail of a celebration that for so many of us in this country has become ever more popular, um, whether in, in its popular culture or in actual uh, celebration. Right, and um, last year at the at the center, we we were able to screen that that wonderful animated film, uh, Coco. Yes, which kind of gives you an insight, uh, but it doesn't go into the you know. It's more about the story. As much as we would have it's, liked. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it's more about that connection, that family connection. It's about the love. It's about those bonds. But it doesn't really go into where it comes from and how it's celebrated, um, in the way that you've you've been able to to share with us so for that i want i wanted to thank you and yeah you know one of the things that, that we did last year um where we were fortunate enough to have a school group visit us uh at the global hub in Ponsfer hall i made a little presentation that actually talked used uh dia los muertos sort of as a touching stone but but it really went to more of how we celebrate Dia de los Muertos, Dia de los Santos all over Latin America. And if you're able to see what's behind me uh, in my, um, in the background that I have on, it's from a celebration in Guatemala of uh, uh, Dia de los Santos. And I, I happened to, I was fortunate enough to have lived in Guatemala for three years, uh, about a decade ago. And one of the one of the most amazing things, and most peculiar in particular, um, things that I experienced while there was uh, this kite festival in Sacatepeques in in Sumpango, and it, it's just tremendous. Uh, one of the, two of the links that you that you will see are actually guide you to these short videos. One which is narrated; it's a not even three minute story on it. The other one is a um, is more about how it, it doesn't have narration. It's just the feeling of being in the middle of it. And as so many things, uh, there's all this order and all this um, uh, pageantry uh, to, to the celebration. Uh, there's also this um, traditional meal, or it's not one meal, but it's, a, uh, it's, it, it's called fiambre. Uh, F-I-A-M as in Mary, B as in... Um, Bob, R E fiambre, and that one is basically canned or or uh, preserved uh, meats and 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 vegetables and breads, things that you can carry with you readily to the cemetery, so you can have them uh, near the grave of your loved ones that uh, that are there, or the remains who's, uh, of the loved ones who are there, and so you have that meal with them. So it's it's not necessarily prepared a cook meal. It's one that's preserved and carried easily. Um, and, and on top of it, then you have the this kite festival. And the kites can be, I don't know if you can see on the photo behind you, some of them can be colossal. They're just tremendous. Uh, the larger ones do not fly. You could not have, because of the wind, you could not have enough, enough people uh, to control those kites if, if you were to fly them. Uh, they're, they're just uh, amazing. But there are some really large ones, not necessarily the larger ones. There are some really large ones that take like 30, 40 people to control. And it, it's amazing because on the one hand, you see this, the idea is to uh, connect the celebration of the, uh, uh, you know, connect the earth and the people who are still living on earth with the people who are up in the sky and in the kite is that sort of conduit that connection that brings that you know that allows you to to get in touch with the dead um and and so there's that moment and then of course anytime you see a kite taking flight it's wonderful 
But then there's the other, the other side of it, right? Like so much in life. Uh, once they lose control of the kite and it starts coming down, um, it can be uh, scary and really funny because you just see the crowds part because where those things are going to fall, it's going it, to, they're big. So everybody's paying attention all the time. So there's the chaos and the order as well. And I think it's so much a part of, of how we celebrate so much all over uh, Latin America without wanting to, to just gloss over as one thing. You know, there's you know, so many different ways. Uh, one of the other links that I shared in there is uh, about celebrations of Day of the Dead that uh, also talk about Ecuador and Bolivia. Um, to give you a, a, a different perspective, uh, I'm, my, my family is from Nicaragua and we have a very simple uh, celebration. We just, we basically, we take the day off, we do visit the cemetery, we bring some flowers, but we don't really have that cultural tradition that so many other countries do, like Guatemala, just up the way, just a little bit north of Nicaragua, you have these all these very elaborate and very um, uh, connected yearly celebrations for hundreds of years, you know. And in Nicaragua, it's it's more the sort of the straightforward. We remember the dead and the saints on the first and the second, and we visit the cemetery, bring some flowers. And that's that's pretty much it. And then and then we get the day off. Uh, so it's you know it's got, <laughs> it's got both of those aspects to it. Uh, but then you also have uh, in 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 other places where, let's say the pre-Columbian or the uh, pre-Hispanic connection is stronger. And when you still have sizable or or significant um, uh, original peoples uh, communities, uh, you you will see a lot of this um, syncretic aspect like you do in Mexico, as you were, as you were saying, is this, this conflagration um, of, of, well, you know, we want to, we want you to have this faith, but in fact, people don't necessarily buy into it fully so that they mix in their own uh, beliefs and their own sort of cultural trajectory. And mm -hmm. so all over South America, that happens as well. Um, and, and, and so um, I, I, just, I just find it so fascinating because, you know, we're so close to Mexico here in the United States. And so we have this tremendous influence, uh, cultural influence from Mexico um, that it just looms large, right? And, and, and at the same time, there's so much more all over the place. Uh, that that especially of course, the, this is uh, a, a Christian I influence, uh, Catholic um, um, uh, settled, I guess, um, continent, right? And so it, the aspects that you see most most salient tend to be the ones that mix in a lot of the Christian beliefs. And, and then you get to the United States and you say, so how do we celebrate uh, our dead, right? And they say, well, maybe it's not even as elaborate as in Nicaragua necessarily, right? We, we, um, we, we might on their, on their birthday or on the anniversary of their death, we might visit the cemetery, um, if that. But most often they, they don't, you know the dead don't seem to have as much of a place in our in our daily lives in the United States as they do in a, in a yearly or or frequent cycle of over Latin America, and so you know as as a, a curiosity, what why would that be? You know, why? I think I think I don't know if you're asking anyone this. It, it, I think you. they. I think they play a much bigger part than people are willing to talk about for fear of, of being judged for their beliefs maybe, or, or, or just not comfortable in discussing something, what they see is, you know, very personal, but uh, I could be wrong. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> no, but I think now would a be fear. a good There's time. There's great fear, you know. Yeah. There's a famous saying um, by the great writer Octavio Paz talking about the Mexican's relationship with death and that he, he woos her and he 
dances with her because we're all going to have to deal with her at some point. And that, that rather than thinking, oh, I'm so afraid what's gonna happen when that happens, it's more of an acceptance and um, a companion that shouldn't inhibit you from trying to, to live again every day to the fullest. I don't know. Or th did anybody make uh, a, a, an altar? Uh, we have one, uh, by the way, we have one um, at the Global Hub at yes. Crossfire Hall, which is not 100% accessible, um, but it is accessible uh, and it's visible almost from the entrance of Crossfire Hall. Uh, and Lisa, of course, had to do something with that as well. So, Lisa, yes. yes. is there a way with your iPad that you're holding in your hand, you give us a close up of your alt altar? Ah, yes. This is uh, the god Tlaloc, god of rain. And also, they say uh, his lands one of eternal springtime. He receives people that uh, have died difficult deaths. So I made an offering for him. And um, an alabrija given to me by Don Manuel Jimenez of Oaxaca, the late maestro, um, whose work inspired me to become interested in Mexican folk art a long time ago. And Lisa, can you tell us what an alabrija is? A wood carving. Okay. And this is his inimitable style, very, very um, stylized features. And here, uh, a piece by another piece by Carlo Manio Pedro, and a Saint Jude, a carved Saint Jude. Uh, he's my favorite. You see, I have a candle for him too. A Katrina. I made a little butterfly tree. We have some skeletons sort of perched in here, <laughs> here and there. And I have corn. Uh, I always put corn for our Mother Earth. You see the corn? There's a shell. Uh, abalone shell skull from Tosco, and also a miniature um, Tewana. She's wearing the costume of the Tewanas of Oaxaca and my love skull. Here I have uh, the tribute to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice. Another piece by uh, Demetrio Aguilar, the, the angel skeleton, a favorite of mine. And another piece from Izucar, gentleman driving a, a double rig. <laughs> and as well, I have uh, cookies that my aforementioned talented sister-in-law did. I have the obligatory alcohol, <laughs> a Talavera uh, ceramic vase, um, another amazing piece of Barro Negro, the big, the big skull in black wearing the flower headdress. Um, and then a closer view of <laughs> my big guy uh, who's standing in for John Lewis and a little shot of my food. And I think that's about uh, it. Lisa, and how, how long does it take you to put this together? This one wasn't long compared to some of those more elaborate ones that you saw me do. Um, so, you know, a lot of thought goes into it before and, um, during, um, like Luz was saying, they kept 
they couldn't resist going back and tweaking and oh yes you know so and so likes this or that and you you start scrounging around or you run out to the grocery store like i did yesterday for skittles um <laughs> and <laughs> and uh so this you know all together um considering originally i wasn't going to do one at all um you know a couple days of work um whereas in the past i would spend an entire month preparing because I made it a point to keep track of everyone who had died in the previous year and keep their names on a list and find a way to get every one of their images on there. And as I said before, this year, I just thought, no, there's no way. There's no way I can do this. So let me just, just, you know, do what I can. So here we have yeah. <laughs> my compromise. <laughs> Oh, that's great. So thank you very much for this. Thank, thank you, you, everybody.